I think so, but I don't see anyone in the waiting room. Yeah, maybe. Just, yeah. just wonder if we could mute your speaker so that I could just listen via your computer. That should work, yeah. Hey, Chris. I think you're muted. Yep. It works. I'm so glad. I had some okay. issues. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Good. <laughs> I had to restart my computer. Yeah. Ah. All right. No worries. Um, we still got a minute. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So so excellent that it works. So um, you start with your prep, right? Uh, yeah. With how how much time do you need? Uh, it'll be maybe a minute. Um, yeah. Okay. F feel free to feel free to use five. Really, like to, like let me like first settle in a little bit. Like welcome all the participants, and then I need okay. to I need to to find some documents because I just restarted the um, um, computer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Um, I was gonna do a few community announcements at the end. I can just do those um, at the beginning, actually. It depends. I mean, it, there will be Balin um, in the call today as well. Uh, maybe he's already waiting. So uh, if you let him in and then he will introduce himself for maybe also for one minute. Ah, um, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so we, we have some time. Yeah. Cool. He's joining now. Hey, Barlin, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, hi. Awesome. Cool. Um, so yeah, Chris and I were just talking about the intro, uh, and I was going to give you a chance to say hello and give a quick background if that's cool. So just a heads up. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> cool. All right, I'm going to let everyone in now. Okay, cool. I'll be. I'll. I'll have to leave at some point. Okay. No uh, worries. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hey, oh, hey, oh. Rudolf. Thanks for joining right on time. Hi, Rudolf. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Thanks for hosting. And we're just going to give uh, maybe a minute or two for a few extra people to drop in. And I believe we're already recording. I think you would have all would have gotten a notification when you joined, but just as a heads up. All right, a few more. Hey, everybody that just joined, welcome back. Good to have you all. I got so much power with the waiting room. <laughs> all right, I'm going to share my screen. People are still rolling in.
Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think I'm just going to get started real quick. Um, I might pause to check the waiting room again in a minute. Oh, wait, it pops up notifications. Sweet. Um, cool. So I'm just going to do a, uh, a quick hello um, and double check that everyone is um, all settled in and, and still doing well since um, last week's session. Uh, and then we're going to have a quick intro um, from Barlin. He's going to say hi. He wasn't able to join us last week. Um, and then we'll get right to the lecture. So not wasting too much time. Um, great, yeah, and the lecture topic today is Introduction to the Hydra AMM, uh, so should be awesome content um, and a pretty simple agenda. <laughs> uh, okay, so the only things on my agenda for saying hello is um, to make sure again, 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 that you guys all have access to these three things. Um, these are the most important links for the course. and. Uh, I just want to give everyone a chance to speak up if they haven't been able to find the Discord channel or the one-stop shop, or if some of the links haven't um, been working for them. Um, so feel free to speak up now or um, send me a message in chat or however you want to reach out um, and be, I would be happy to help. But without these three, it's tough to participate. So <laughs> um, cool. And then, uh, yeah, I guess if any, it's hard to see the participants and do a quick check, but if anyone is new, um, wasn't able to join last week uh, as a researcher participant that was accepted into the course um, and would like to speak up and just say hi to everyone, um, I could give you a chance to do that right now. Um, tough to see who would have, who exactly that was, but I'll just give you uh, a second if you are new it would just be like a quick name and background and then why you're here oh we got a hand raise rudolf yes i had not the possibility to join the first session due to academic work but now i'm here uh i'm coming from physics and it uh i'm myself uh, a bit investing in cryptos and the main reason is, I think the whole concept, this is a new thing uh, that's also of political interest because it, it kind of enables uh, a more democratic financial system. And I'm highly interested in the technical aspects and uh, in the mathematical aspects and tried myself to, to model some, some systems and thought that, well, it's better to work together than working alone. And that's the reason I'm here. Awesome. Well, you'll definitely get the technical side of things. And that's a great attitude to have coming into crypto. So glad to have you. Uh, all right. Anyone else want to jump in? If not, um, Barlin, do you want to say hi to everyone? Yeah, happy to. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Matt Barlin, and I'm the lead systems engineer at Block Science, and uh, essentially been with Block Science since the uh, very beginning, so three and a half years ago, which seems is, which is forever in in crypto <laughs> land. Uh, yeah, my uh, my background in, originally is in naval architecture and marine engineering, so designing. Uh, basically anything that floats, um, which really led to where my specialties were in like, advanced hull forms, um, such as uh, hovercraft. And and uh, in that time as a naval architect, I was um, both uh, model testing, building actual physical models, but also developing uh, prediction simulation software. Um, so did that for a while, then uh, went did my master's in ocean systems management. So then moved on to essentially large scale logistics problems coupled with the finance and economics of, of shipping and, and moving things across the world. Um, and then uh, went into and did some teaching of math, physics, uh, electronics, and uh, then onto data. And with all of those combined, <laughs> um, crypto seemed like a pretty good uh, venture. So um, yeah, so really my 
at Black Science. I essentially do it, have done it all because <laughs> I was there at the beginning when we didn't have very much um, besides a hand, uh, less than a handful of people. So um, anyway, the some of the things that we'll be going over um, in the course are really things that, that we like our processes that we've developed over this time that really have the notion of how we would, uh, you know, correctly it, or, you know, like smartly uh, do a system design um, approach and really have tried to, uh, you know, work on that from, from the very beginning. And um, it's really exciting that, that we're here now been able to really use that approach, refine it over time and be able to deliver that, uh, you know, in an education style to all of you. So it's really exciting, even just, even though I missed, also missed the first lecture, um, you know, just even, even to hear the words of Rudolph is, is very much, you know, very exciting to hear. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, I'll be kind of doing about half of the uh, upcoming lectures I'm putting next week. So happy to see you guys. Awesome, great to have you Barlin. Thanks for making it. Um, and yeah, I think that speaks to the, the exciting fact that having diverse set of backgrounds just leads to really awesome findings. Um, and token engineering is a great space to apply really anything from marine engineering to physics, to economics, whatever it is, you'll find a spot in token engineering. So um, <clears throat> very cool. So Chris, uh, I think we might be ready to jump over. Are you all set? Yeah, I'm happy to take over. Please let me uh, share my screen. Yep. I hope this is allowed for me and then I would just proceed with uh, with the presentation for today. Uh, you have you yeah. have to have enable to stop and then you might be able to Ah, all participants there it is. Okay. It Thank looks good, try. yeah. Excellent. Okay, you now all should be able to see my screen. And the first slide of the presentation, which is the introduction slide. Uh, today's session is on the introduction to the Hydra AMM. We will be talking about um, the general idea of AMMs, uh, how we came to, how the Hydra team came to us to design a new concept and why they want to do this. And I want to give some, um, uh, some outlook for the next sessions and for you to be able to see how now that you've then now that the stage is set, um, you would be able to, to follow, uh, follow along how these, um, these AMMs um, are implemented and designed uh, with the block science engineering approach. So the agenda for today, uh, we will very briefly talk about the introduction and the goal of the first session. So we will, we will just set the stage for, for the session today. And then we will introduce an AMM and what it is. So maybe there are people in the, in the room who haven't heard of the concept of AMMs, or maybe there are some people who would like to refresh their memory, or maybe there are some things that are not entirely clear. So I want to get, uh, get this um, set in, in the beginning, because this is very important to be able to discuss all everything that follows along. And then uh, we will talk about the key design options in the construction of an AMM. So once we've understood the concept of an AMM and what it is, we will uh, be interested in exploring which different degrees of freedom do you have uh, if when you design such a system and uh, what are the implications on particular things, for example, like market metrics. Um, we will talk through four examples of alternative designs. So do you really can see hands on what the design options are and how they are implemented in practice, because there are many um, different AMMs already out there and they make use of the different concepts. So you will be, will, you will be able to connect uh, those things already. And uh, finally, the, uh, once we've discussed uh, the um, different uh, the, um, design options, we will really see what the implications on the key performance metrics are. So we will just de define some metrics. We will see who are the system participants and what are they looking for when they participate in such a system. And we will investigate how the design choices influence the behavior of those metrics. This is important because this is what you want to steer all along. This is what is interested, interesting for you. If you are a designer of a system, you want to have in mind how will the agents in the system react and they will react accordingly to particular system metrics that they observe, right? 
Um, and we want to make sure that we understand the metrics and we understand the um, agent's uh, incentives uh, without really imposing too much agent behaviors. So what will be key and what will be very important um, to follow through to, to the entire session uh, will be the concept of mechanism design without having restrictions imposed on agent behavior. So we will we will say we are able to construct a particular mechanism. We are able to construct a particular system and uh, we want to make it work. We want to make it function properly such that regardless of what agents do with it, we have particular properties that are upheld. So really ignoring away, attracting away any particular misbehavior or strategic behavior from agents, making the system work in its, uh, on itself. And then at the second stage, once you've figured out how the system is supposed to work, then you can start introducing uh, intelligent agents and uh, explorative agents and strategic agents to see how this base system will evolve over time if you put some intelligence into decision making. So these are two separated concepts, but very important to understand that the mechanism design problem on its own is isolated from everything that follows, uh, follows along. And afterwards, and afterwards we have um, we have people trying to exploit or interact with the system. Uh, this is is key because this is the, the first part of the session today. Will allow you to understand how AMMs work and how they are designed, and then we will take a closer look at the Hydra system and, and from a bird's eye perspective. We will not only look at the liquidity subsystem because this is the key important part um, of the system, but there are some other components that that, uh, that play along as well, um, important as well. And um, and we will we will take the, the hydro system, discuss uh, their subsystems and different um, different how they interrelate with each, other, with each other. And what everything that comes afterwards will be related to an outlook to the next session. So we will then discuss how, given such a system, how given such design objectives, we are able to construct a process that leads us from the system requirements over system design to mechanism design to parameter optimization and to, to particular implementation choices. So this is the agenda for today. I think um, we've got uh, um, uh, uh, around 90 minutes or 100 minutes left. Um, I will uh, make sure to allocate some time in the end for Q&A and also in between. So uh, whenever you feel that you have questions, you can just interrupt me, you can stop me, you can ask because uh, then it's very important to get all, all of the things that you that you not understand out of the way. But uh, I will also make sure that after each um, of the topics that are uh, um, described here, I will take some time for you to, to, to have a discussion. Maybe there are some concepts, some ideas that we want to discuss in the group. So let us uh, define the goals for today. The goals for today are to understand what the Hydra AMM is and how it stands out from traditional AMMs or already implemented AMMs on the market. So there are some things that differentiate the Hydra system from existing AMMs, and we want to understand why this is so and what are the implications on economic metrics, but also on technical metrics. We want to distinguish between various subsystems of the Hydra system, but we want to still focus on the liquidity subsystem and its functionality because an automated market maker, the core of it is obviously the liquidity subsystem. So this has to be defined, this has to work, but this system is connected to other systems like for example, the governance system or the power chain system or a funding system. And these systems are interconnected. So the behavior of the whole system cannot be discussed or cannot be interpreted if uh, these things would be disentangled. Therefore, we have to understand how these systems interact with each other. We want to identify the mechanisms of the liquidity subsystem and their connection to agent roles and incentives via observable metrics. So we really want to pin down how the liquidity subsystem works and which agents participate in the system, which stakeholders it has, what their incentives are and which metrics they observe for their particular decision choices. And also always keep an eye on the importance of the block science engineering design approach. So really try to learn the methodology. This is what, what will be the motive of the whole course, because we want to teach you during the first six sessions as introduced last time, the methodology, so that you are able to follow along, that you are able to understand how the system was designed. And hopefully in the second part of the course where you are free to choose your own research questions, reiterate using this methodology on your own research questions. 
So this is always um, a key thing that you should keep in mind, not only how the system works, but why we are doing it and why we are designing it as we do. So let us now move over to the first thing. What is the Hydra AMM? And what an AMM is in general? So let me know please now if there is someone in the group who doesn't know what an automated market maker is or didn't really encounter them so far in, in, their, uh, in the research or in their, their practice. Is there anyone who hasn't heard the concept of an AMM at all? I will take this as a no, but I will still try to, uh, to focus on some, some key important messages so that we understand what it is all about. So what is the purpose of an automated market maker? The, the, an automated maker is a peer to pool method for decentralized cryptocurrency exchange. So um, any trader can swap tokens by sending, for example, a currency A uh, to the contract and receiving an amount of currency B in return. So it is an exchange mechanism. You can interact with it, but you have, don't have to interact with someone directly, a peer, but you, have, you, you can interact with a contract. You can send currency there and you will receive a different currency in exchange. This means that there is no need to maintain an order book. So in some exchanges, you would need to have orders, bid, uh, and, uh, sell orders and buy orders, and they would have to be matched. This is not necessary for an AMM because the, 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 the trades that are coming in can be executed directly by the system. There is no need to find a counterparty and the, and the system will always accept the trade orders acting as an automated market maker. So this is the definition. And uh, so the question is, how is the swap price um, derived? And the swap price is, it is implemented in a system that the price for this exchange is derived from the quantities of token in the pools. So the system has a definition and according to this definition, when a trade comes in or a trade request comes in, the system determines the price and then the trade is executed. Who are the agents who participate? Uh, there are some internal interface and governance roles. What does it mean? We have some internal roles that are restricted to the, to, the, to the actions within the protocol itself. So these would be, for example, the traders. These would be, for example, um, the um, liquidity providers. These would be, for example, arbitrageurs. But also there would be people like, for example, developers or researchers. So these are people like, like us who are taking part in the maintenance, governance, and design of, the, of these systems. So, so, so this is what, what, why we have the definition between internal interface and governance roles. Some roles, are, some agents are restricted to, um, to the activity within the liquidity pool, for example. Some others are restricted to the, to the activities um, that, uh, that act on, on different markets. An arbitrageur would compare the market of this AMM with the current market price. So this would be an interface role, someone who would act on two markets and try to compare prices and make use of arbitrage opportunities. So these would be the main stakeholders that you have. What is the functionality of the AMM? The functionality is that uh, there is a liquidity provider. So there has to be someone who um, provides liquidity to the contract. The co contract cannot be empty. So so for traders to be able to step in, there has to be someone who first provides liquidity to the pool. And this would be the liquidity that can be exchanged by other people. And um, this happens by liquidity provision. Uh, for example, if there are uh, two assets in a liquidity pool, let's say um, Ethereum and, um, and DAI, then a liquidity provider would have to provide both, asset, both assets simultaneously and therefore, an in, um, therefore initialize or the, therefore um, provide liquidity to the pool uh, for, for traders to be able to, to swap. And by providing liquidity, um, um, the, this agent would receive shares to the liquidity pool. So depending on how much of the value of the pool is being provided, this is the participation of the liquidity provider with his own capital. This means that this much of shares, this percentage, this relative contribution is being represented by a, by a liquidity provider share, a token share. So for example, if in this liquidity pool, there already is 100 ETH and 100 DAI, and someone provides additional 
100 eat and 100 die, then he would have provided 50% of the new value of the pool. And therefore he would receive 50% of the tokens. So if there is then this liquidity in the pool, then this agent uh, can earn money that uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the assets that he provided because he will, uh, he will be um, qualifying for, um, for trading fees. So when traders step in and try to exchange the liquidity in the liquidity pool by swapping token A for token B, they don't only receive the, the, uh, the reserve currency, but they also have to leave some of the, of the, of the tokens in the pool, uh, which are the fees, the trading fees. And this is the main reason why liquidity providers would even provide liquidity to the pool because they have ex an expected, re expected return on their investment. So a liquidity provider says, okay, I have some spare liquidity, I can put it into the pool. And when traders then will use this pool and when, they when there will be the trading volume, then I will earn on my uh, liquidity. And, uh, and this is how in general a liquidity and an AMM works. So you have these two uh, main, uh, main, main agents, one who provides liquidity and one who trades. And then obviously there is someone who is the arbitrageur. So the person who compares the current market price in this AMM with external markets and tries to step in when there are mismatches in the prices. So this is why this liquidity pool will work as a price oracle and follow on with the market price according to, to what, what, what can be observed on other markets. So what are now the key metrics of an automated market maker? At the most important KPI for a liquidity provider is his return on investment. So he will only provide liquidity because he has some expected gains, some expected positive returns. So he will be interested in how much can he gain over time? What is his expert expected ROI? And this ROI is determined on the one hand by trading fees. So how much, how high are the trading fees? The higher the trading fees, the more he will earn. The higher the trading volume, the more he will earn. But there is also one additional aspect of participating with liquidity in a liquidity pool which is impermanent loss. This is an, 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 a metric or this is a um, statistic that impacts um, the liquidity provider in a negative way. We will, we will get to it, um, but in, in a nutshell, it is basically the trade-off uh, between providing liquidity to a liquidity pool versus held, holding this liquidity privately in, in, in one's private portfolio. When prices change, then in the one case, when you provide liquidity to the pool, you will have some losses in compared to if you just held the, the assets privately. And this term, uh, this, this loss is, is termed impermanent loss, which is bad for the liquidity provider. But since he hopes that the trading fees that are accumulated in the liquidity pool are higher than the impermanent loss, he still is expecting a positive gain. For the, for the trader, there is the metric of obviously of, of the fees. So the more fees he has to pay, the, the worse it is for the trader. But also there is this additional metric of slippage. Slippage is the change in price for a trade. So whenever a trade occurs, uh, you only see the current market price in the liquidity pool. But if you trade a bigger amount, then not all tokens that you want to trade qualify for the current market price because every token that you swap will change the market price in the liquidity pool. So therefore this price change, this, this, this change of price when there are trades occurring is termed slippage. And this is something that impacts the trader in a negative way. So if he wants to trade a big size, then he would also have to account for the slippage that he will be suffering. Let us look a little bit at the market. So uh, what are the different AMMs on the market? And we, we know a few, so there are many AMMs already out there because the concept of liquidity provision is a prominent one. And many teams try to experiment with different designs and different properties of these liquidity pools. So uh, there, is, uh, there is fierce competition on the AMM market because everyone tries to design, define a protocol that would have the best trading fees or it would have the best, um, the best um, return for the, for the liquidity providers. And 
And this is why there are different, um, there are different protocols competing for the market share. And what they are really competing for is the liquidity. And we will learn today why this is the case. Uh, but uh, everyone, every protocol tries to attract as much as possible liquidity into the liquidity pool uh, because um, this has a positive impact on, um, on some economics of, of, the, of the AMM. And um, we, will, we will get to this, to this connection in, in a minute. But after this uh, short introduction, are there any questions um, about AMMs now? So is there uh, something that, uh, that someone um, and now present here would like to, to know? Excellent. I don't see any questions. Cool. OK, in that case, uh, let us move on. And let us move on to the different pool design options. So finally. Why, what can you choose if you design a liquidity pool? First of all, you can, you can design the liquidity pool structure. So you can decide how much assets you would like to pool together and in which way. If we, if we think of, of Uniswap, which is the most prominent, and the easiest um, AMM uh, to think of, uh, we know that there are two assets in this liquidity pool. There is one asset on the left-hand side and there's one asset on the right-hand side. And these assets are pooled together. So the quantities of those assets in this pool determine the exchange rate between these assets. But this also means that uh, what you have to do if you want to create token exchange pairs, you have to, for many currencies, you have to pair assets together. This means that if you want to have a Bitcoin for ETH, you have to create a bit ETH pool. If you want to have Bitcoin for DAI, you have to create a second pool, which is Bitcoin and DAI. If you want to create exchange Ethereum for DAI, now you have to create a third pool. So this is meant by the liquidity pool structure. You have two assets and this is what you can do. Then there are alternative ways to solve this. For example, with Balancer, you could pool more assets together. So in Balancer, you can pool eight assets into one pool. And uh, this means that uh, you can create pools that have more than two assets together, right? So the structure of the pool is kind of different. And this means that whenever you provide liquidity to this pool or when you remove liquidity to the pool or when you swap with this pool, you have different impacts on those assets that are in there. Now, what, uh, what uh, uh, is going to happen in, in the Hydra MM is we are going to pool all assets together. So we, we want to allow that there are not two assets, not eight assets, but we want to create one pool to pull all the assets together. And um, this is why the system has this name of the Omni pool. So there is only one pool present and all assets are there. And um, it is tricky because it gets a little bit more complicated, right? But what are the benefits? The benefits are that you don't have to create as many pools if you want to have trading pairs. So it's more capital efficient. You, you don't have to use as much capital to create the pool, right? Because you don't have to split your capital into different pools. So this is the first thing, liquidity pool structure. The second thing are the invariant properties. So if you've decided on, an, on a pool structure that you want to impose, now you can think of what do you want to keep invariant over time? So which properties in the pool you would like not to have change? And the most prominent one is, again, in the case of Uniswap, is um, the constant product rule. So remember, in the context of a Uniswap, we know that the token quantities within these pools determine the market price. And it is being derived from this particular formula, which is X times Y is K, which means the amount of token A times the amount of token B has to be constant over time. So, reg so regardless which changes you do, so if you change the amount of token A, then you have to change the amount of token B accordingly, such that the product remains the same. And this is kind of the idea. So you can think of an invariant property. You can say that every trade that you do has to fulfill this invariant property. And um, there are different AMMs out there, different concepts. For example, not the constant product, but there is a constant sum between two assets. So you can say that X plus Y has to be K. And now you might start wondering, why would you do this? 
And you would like to do this because it has different impacts on the economics of the AMM. So this design choice has, diff has the, the different implications on what will happen if you, if you swap assets. For example, if you have a constant sum um, invariant property, you can change exchange assets without slippage because, this, because the token price doesn't change regardless how much, how much token you, you want to swap in the current trade. But this also means that you can drain a pool because if you have x times x plus y is 1000 and if you if you take out everything of y then you cannot get negative right so this means that you can get to a situation where you wouldn't really have anything left in this in, on the on one side of the pool which is not true if you have the product right because if you have x times y it has to be k then you don't really have this problem because this never can be zero, right? So, uh, so you, you, the, the other amount would go to infinity, and it's almost impossible to provide as much uh, as much liquidity in the one token such that you would drain the other side of the pool. So, the one um, invariant property is more uh, beneficial if you have, for example, if you want to, to swap uh, stable tokens, because when you have the same prices, it's it's um, it's good to create um, a constant sum uh, invariant property. But this fails if you have different uh, if, if you have different assets in the pool. So, so you already see here that there are different uh, decisions that you can make that will have the impact on trading behavior or even like which assets qualify for this liquidity pool. Uh, but there is nothing for free, right? So you cannot choose um, choose um, um, a system that would have everything set to, to um, imperfection. But kind of this is the goal of the design. So you want to find the best design for your particular purpose, for your particular idea. And this is what we want to, to learn in this course. We want to talk to how to given particular constraints and how given particular objectives, you can make these design choices so that you optimize for a particular goal. The next thing that you can design uh, is the base asset properties and supply. This means that uh, there is always a risk asset and there is a base asset in such liquidity pools. Um, and if you remember the first version of Uniswap, uh, you had always to provide Ethereum on the one hand side and a random um, an ERC20 token on the left hand side. This means that there was this, um, this requirement that the base asset has to be ETH, has to be Ethereum, and you have to do it, right? Um, but this was uh, loosened over time, so it it can be it can be restricted. You can say, okay, there is a base asset that will always be one in one particular pool or not. In the second version of Uniswap, it was it was released um, uh, such that uh, this requirement was was uh, loosened, and and you were able to provide any ERC twenty token pair. So you didn't really have to to pull Ethereum into the into the pool always. But there are still design options by whom this asset is being provided. So there is this option that you, the liquidity provider provides both sides of the, of the liquidity pool. There is this option that um, the pool, the protocol provides one side of the, of the pool. So uh, if you remember, if you know, for example, Banker, Banker is, a, is, a, is an AM automated market maker that says, okay, you only have to provide one side. We will mint one token accordingly such that it matches the value that you've provided. And there are some options also for other people to step in and provide liquidity and in the base token if they wish to. So if, if you don't want to provide both sides, if there is someone else who would like to step in, there are some protocols who facilitate this condition as well. And then if you've decided these three things, so like what is the structure, what is the property that you want to keep up help and what are the base assets that you define or uh, to allow into the pool, then you can start specifying the mechanism. So you can say, okay, we want people to be able to trade. We want people to be able to provide liquidity, but how do we allow them to do this, right? So there are many ways to define this and you can specify this as you wish, but the particular definition of your current mechanisms and the parameterization of your mechanisms will have a big impact on how the system will evolve over time. So you can restrict the system to be more sensitive or less sensitive by providing particular mechanisms and particular parameters to these mechanisms as you please. So this is also the last point, parameter choices and policies. Now you step more, you step more away from the mechanism design problem and step more into the, um, the governance of the system because this is what actually is needed to be done over time. 
you can initialize the system with particular mechanisms and parameters, but you have to be able to react to different market conditions. So these parameters um, can be needed to be changed over time because, uh, for example, you have too much slippage and you accumulate or you accumulate too much uh, too much impermanent loss in, in your system. And then you have to react to what's happening on the market. You have to be able to change the parameters and change the policies such that your system goes back in track, for example, or works as intended and so on. So these are the key choices that you are free to set. And we will talk this through for the Hydra AMM today. So we will talk about what the liquidity pool structure is, what the invariant properties are, and, and so on. May, are there maybe any questions now related to this slide? Uh, there was one question in the chat. OK, so should I check it out? Uh, yeah. Uh, does constant sum pool have any other advantage than slippage? Uh, not that I know, um, I'm aware of. So um, um, I think the most obvious one is slippage, obviously. But and maybe um, maybe that the yeah the prices are quite obvious, right? But but nothing that I can tell you like from 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 the top of my head right now. No. Just one more follow-up question on the Bancor's ability to mint a token um, to correspond the value uh, which is in the token pool. So what's the advantage of doing that? Is that better cap better capital efficiency or? Yeah, so the reason behind this is, uh, is twofold. Well, first of all, they want to have um, one token that is basically their base token, the system token that is valuable because when you force, um, when you force, um, each pool to contain your native token, then this is good for your system basically because it accumulates value and it, it grows in, in, in importance. Uh, but uh, the main reason is that you don't expect people to provide as much assets, right? So you, you kind of relieve a little bit the, the liquidity provider, but, not, but by not uh, requiring too much of capital investment. And the other thing is that if you provide liquidity elastically, as they do in this in this uh, sense, they can uh, they can ha have a, an additional degree of, of parameter and, and a degree of freedom how they can steer the system. So there is something that they have in mind where they say, okay, maybe we want to mint it, um, maybe not always 100% of the value, but maybe a little bit less than 100% than because it has uh, economic uh, ramifications on the system, right? So you have this um, additional control um, uh, le uh, lever that you can, you can make use of um, in, in your economics. Cool. Um, now let us move on to the next slide. What do we have here? Yeah, we have like a visual, visual. Yes, Sorry. Is there, yeah. Sorry, Chris, there, there was one more question. Um, okay. Well, there are, looks like there was a comment from Rudolf, but also a question Sorry. from Amanjat. Uh, he asked if you could repeat the specification of mechanisms design choice. Could you repeat the specification of mechanism design? Okay, so let me go back here. Um, this is kind of complicated to, uh, uh, to explain. Uh, from without having the all of the course, right? Uh, having talked through. So this is something that we will cover during the course. You will see um, that, that that there are some mechanisms. Um, um, okay, let me let me fra frame it differently. Uh, what you want to do to, for your system to do, you want to allow three different mechanisms. You want to allow the add and remove liquidity mechanism. So there are liquidity providers stepping in and stepping out of the system. And you want the trading mechanism to be there. So you know that these are the actions that your system has to be able to perform. But now the question is, how do you specify them in detail? So how, what is the particular, how, how is the system changing when you, when you, when you provide assets to the pool? So um, you can, you can define this mechanism in one million different ways. You, you, you know that there will be added liquidity. You know that there will be shares distributed to the liquidity providers. You know that there will be some other impact on the system variables, but which ones exactly, right? So this definition of a formula or the next state transition of the system, this is what you need to define. So you know that there will be something that adds liquidity and now the system changes, but write it down, right? So how to write this formula down? What is the state update when an agent wants to perform this? So this is the specification of the mechanism. And you will see in the course that there are 
different ways how to specify this mechanism for one liquidity pool. And if you choose a different formula, if you choose a different parameterization of this, of this, um, of this mechanism, you will have different impacts of the system metrics. And this is ultimately what you want to optimize for. So with this in mind, you will see that the mechanism choice is quite important how the system will behave over time. And in our derivation of, um, of the particular mechanisms for, for a given system, we will step from the business requirements over system requirements to the mechanisms definitions. So you first say, what do you want from a business perspective your system to do? Then you are the next step would be to find the optimal mechanism to do it. Optimal in a sense with an eye on the metrics. So how it, will it impact the metrics that you are defining? And then you can try to swap these mechanisms in and out. You can make simulations, you can build a model, you can say, okay, this is how this is the particular mechanism that you choose now. How does it impact the metrics? And if you exchange this mechanism for a different one, you see, okay, now we have a different mechanism that does the same thing, right? It adds and removes liquidity, but it, it impacts the metrics differently. So now you see that you can you can swap different tests. And this is precisely what the system model was built to do. And CatCat is very very strong in solving. So, so I hope that this clarifies the question, but uh, with a little patience in mind, um, you will be able to see the specification of the mechanisms during the next few sessions. You will see precisely why and how we pin down the mechanisms for the Hydra AMM such that they fulfill the business requirement. Let me go back to um, the alternative pool structure. So this is an example of what we talked about before. And you see that here on the left-hand side, you have Uniswap and in Uniswap, if you want to create a token exchange pair, you have to pool assets together, right? So you have to put in asset one, asset four, you, here we have asset two, asset five, asset three and asset six. So you have always token pairs and one pool always contains two assets. And if you want to have different token pairs, you have to use more of the same asset to split it into different pools because yeah, you would have to have, for example, ETH here, ETH here, ETH here, and then you can have Bitcoin, DAI, and DOTS, for example, but then this means that you need three times the amount of liquidity to provide even those token pairs. So, so this is basically capital inefficient, right? Because you have to, for each exchange pair, you have to provide liquidity. Um, in Balancer, as we said, you can pool uh, up to eight assets together. So this is represented here. You don't have to pool only two, but you can. You can, you can reduce it to, to one, two, three, four, five, six assets, but up to eight assets you can pool together into one Balancer pool. So you can see that Uniswap is a special case of Balancer. So it is like a special case of a Balancer pool where you would have only two assets. And in addition, to, to this, in Balancer, you have also different weights which you can define. So you can say that you don't want these uh, assets to be split evenly in the pool, which is always the case for Uniswap. So you always have 50% of value here and 50% of value here. In Balancer, you can define weights that you would like to impose. You can say, I want a Balancer portfolio with eight assets. And these assets have, for example, weights of 10%, 20%, 10%, 5%, 50%, and so on. In total, they have to sum up to one, obviously but you can define a, your, your particular portfolio that you're trying to, to, to set up. Now with Banker, as discussed, you have the same concept as with Uniswap. So you also have split um, assets split into only two pools, uh, into two assets per pool. But on the right-hand side, you always have one base asset and the base asset here is, um, is the Banker native token. So on the right-hand side and even more, it is not being provided by the user. It is being minted when, there, when assets are coming in, right? So this is the logic of Banker. You don't have to provide both assets here. You provide only one and we will for you mint the second token here. But obviously this makes the ban, uh, Banker native token very impor important and it rises in value because it is required for each, for each um, exchange in the protocol. And finally, we get to a pool structure where we see that what, what the Hydra team is trying to solve, they're trying to combine all of these things kind of together because they want to, in, to create one single pool that would hold an, an arbitrary number of assets here on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there, there would be the Hydra native token that always accounts for 50% of the, of the total portfolio, of the total pool but it is being minted by the protocol. So again, the liquidity provider provides only one asset or only this asset, only this asset, and the right-hand side of the pool is being provided by the protocol. So a combination, 
basically cherry picking, like cherry picking of the best ideas from other protocols, making it more capital efficient because you, you only need one pool and you, all of your liquidity is pooled together. So it's quite, it's quite good because it's not split up during the, over the protocol. And also you only have to provide only left, the, the left-hand side of the pool and, and you can neglect the right-hand side. This is being minted by the protocol. So this is the key design choice that the Hydra team came, um, came up with and they came, uh, came to us with. Because they said, we want to build this liquidity pool, help us uh, to design the, the mechanisms and help us to design the state transitions and, and all the changes in the system when we pool the assets together, because it's obviously more complicated. Here, you need only one, um, one equation to, to, uh, to de derive the prices between the two assets, because you have this constant product, and this is different for all of the pools that you create here. But here you don't, right? So here you have one invariant property and you have, you have one system. And if you change something in asset one, it has some ramifications on all of the other assets in the pool, but you don't really want this, right? So you want to make sure that whenever there is an action being performed with the pool, that the changes happen accordingly to what is good or what is well-defined. And this is the first, uh, this was the first challenge, the first question that, uh, that we had to deal with in the design of the system. Now that we pull all assets together, how will the system perform? Which mechanisms do we define? How to observe the metrics? How do, does this system even compare to the alternative systems? Because we will see that on the market, it is very important to, for the users to even compare to which protocol they want to use for liquidity provision or for trading, depending on the metrics in this protocol. So the, the, the protocol user uh, who is a trader, for example, and simply wants to exchange one token for another one and doesn't really care whether he goes to Uniswap, to Banker or to Hydra, he just cares uh, where do I have to pay the lowest price and where do I get the lowest slippage? So this is what he has in mind. And, and therefore, um, you have to not only make the system work and make it like, okay, it functions, it is well-defined, perfect, but you also have to keep in mind how does it perform compared to other systems on the market? Because this is ultimately what will drive your, uh, your trading volume or your liquidity volume that you, that you get. So these are the questions that, um, that were answered um, in, in, in the design um, of this, of this um, system. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I will, I will get to them uh, in a minute. So let us really go into the metrics. So let us really see what the, how the metrics are defined. Um, Chris, we, we have a few questions in the chat. Is now a good time or we can- Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So where do we have here? Um, uh, looks like starting with yeah. Nico. Could the balance uh, weight by dynamic XM based on amount of tokens circulated? Uh, this is a, definitely a decision that can be done. And this is also one decision that the other team wanted to implement. So a dynamic weight. And, but in the, in the initial definition in balancer, you have, uh, you have um, a predefined constant weight. So when you initialize a pool, you say, okay, this is what you split up your capital for, and this is what the weights are, and then all trades and all mechanisms work accordingly without these weights ever being changed. But um, the question actually was, when the Hydro team uh, had the, the idea of how to design the pool, could we make something similar to Balancer, but with changing weights over time? Yeah, so, so this is a good question, yeah. Um, what do we have here? A comment. I've seen uh, how new trading pairs can be inserted in Uniswap, Balance, and Banco without too much effort. But how can this be done in Hydra? Very nice question. Thank you very much. So it is truly the case that uh, it is very difficult without an evaluation process to um, to in, in, in inject a new asset into the into the pool. So this is correct. So the first uh, problem that you have to solve when you try to design the Hydra pool is how to design it such that it works when when you don't even provide new assets, right? So you start uh, with a list of whitelisted assets and say, these are the ones that are being traded and perfect. And the second question now, once you've solved this static problem is how will a new asset change um, change the, um, the, um, the composition of the pool and how even prohibits that an asset that, that is coming in destroys the value of the pool or can be used to exploit value from the pool because you just provide a token with no value and then you, you exchange it for a different token in the pool and so on. So this is a very good question and this is something that you are heavily invited to investigate in during the research of the course. But uh, I, I'm not sure if this is already is this already set this, this answer. Kuba, do you have an answer? Maybe? Yeah. Yes, there are uh, there are a few possibilities, uh, like the people ones. Uh, the 
uh, the the first one the first one for listing of new assets which are not like totally new but they are not just include they are not yet included in the in the omni pool we can we can get a we can get an aggregated uh, weighted average price for like last 24 hours or something like that from like aggre uh, aggregator of more oracles uh, for the for the like fresh new tokens it, it's complicated and the similar the similar issue has also like bank or design uh, while they are solving it by wide listing of tokens which they are considered as a safe uh in our case there is like governance body which we are calling like economic council uh, and they are uh and they are also like claiming that this this asset is meant to be safe because like there's for example like very legitimate uh and capable team or the the token is like or like this project has like enough security audits and so uh but what is like what is like partial solution for this uh, are currently the goal of this course, which are dynamic fees. So we can also like uh, we can also design these dynamic fees as a like uh, like backstop solution for these cases uh, when for example when when Hydra as a protocol we realize that there is like very strong like sell pressure. On one token, it can be like physically deactivated from trading. Yeah, thank you, Kuba, uh, and thank you, Rubel, for the question. It is, as you can see, a tricky one, so it is not uh, not very obvious how to solve this. But this is something that there are some ideas in mind. They all involve um, uh, discretionary policies, so some some form of voting evaluation process, whatever. Uh, but uh, this is um, a very hot topic to discuss and potentially solve even during the, the course. What do we have here? What is the design advantage of HX compared to BNT? Um, the design advantage is that you uh, pool all assets together into one pool and that you don't need to, to perform, for example, two trades. So if, you, if you're if uh, you in the banker um, system, you still have uh, different pools. And when you want to exchange one token for another one, you have to do two things, two transactions, right? So, I mean, the system does them for you, but there are two transactions going on. And in, in the Hydro case, this would go directly. Yeah, so, so it's it's a little bit more efficient because you know you don't need to do this uh, as uh, Chris mentioned the two like trades, but there is also some other feature which we are calling uh, order matching. So basically, we can even we can match the Hydra protocol is matching transactions going in opposite direction because basically everything what is fair form uh, every trade which is fair form in AMMs they are basically market buy market sell. So we can uh, we can match them even in the mempool, and the very nice outcome of this is basically like zero slippage on the like matched size of these trades. That's the one thing, and the second thing, uh, which is like uh, which is also nice for the users, but more for the like stakeholders of the whole system is as a system is allowing to pay fees in like any asset which is uh, which is listed in the in the token in the pool. So, for example, you can you can choose to pay all network fees, for example, in Dai, or ETH, or Bitcoin, or whatever you want, and it's uh, it's included in the pool. The these fees, as they are like exchange on on the backend, or these assets which are exchange on the backend for the HDX, and then maybe burned. The the whole the whole system, the whole protocol is maintaining or is conservating values for the for the protocol and liquidity providers. And its stakeholders much, much, much nicer than like proof of work systems, which are leaking much more value because of mining and like constant sell pressure from from miners. Cool. Thank you, Kubo. The next question is: Can you please once again explain what are the problems we face right now and we need to tackle with the Hydra's uh, protocol design? And 
partly so the questions uh, the some of the problems have already been solved but during the course that we will walk you through is the way how we solved it during the during the last uh, few months but we started with the challenge of how to even like if you want to pool all assets together how to define the proper mechanisms how to pro parameterize them how to meet the business requirements such that every action works as intended and now once the system is defined which we already have but and you will you will learn this during the next few weeks to see how we really solve these problems um, now uh, uh, now the problem is or or now the the idea is how to uh, optimize the system for particular metrics right so performing this process of parameter selection under uncertainty that is the uh, that will be discussed i think in the sixth session of the, of the atomic pool course uh, that you say okay now that you have to find the system now you have to select the proper parameters for the system such that it performs optimally on the market but you will see that then optimal performance always has some uh, some trade-offs with it so you have to choose the trade-offs accordingly so, uh, so that your system performs like with these trade-offs in mind and once you've solved this, then the next question is, or the problem that we are really facing is, how to now that we have a perfectly working system, implement a fee mechanism that will be used as an additional parameter to steer the, the, the agent behavior within the system. So, so this would be the, the, the most prominent problem that we are facing right now is now that we've got the system working, which we have, uh, the question is how to make it work with fees or how to implement the fee mechanism that will improve the performance of Next question is, uh, what is the invariant measure in Hydra? Uh, let me defer this question until uh, the two weeks, next two weeks or three weeks, because uh, we will talk through the specification and the, the derivation of particular, um, particular um, these things in, in during the next sessions. But just just for you to get an idea, I mean the invariant measure is it's it's more complicated than Uniswap. But the, the general idea is that you obviously want that when there is liquidity provision, when someone provides liquidity, the assets don't change, that the prices don't change. So this is something that is that is um, inherited from the, from the Uniswap mechanism. But there are some additional features which you can think of. For example, now that you don't only have two assets, right? So you have uh, like, let's say a, more, a, a bigger number of assets in your liquidity pool. What you want is that if you trade two tokens, so you, you want uh, that only the prices of these two tokens change and the others don't, right? So you don't really want to affect uh, uh, unrelated trading pairs. You don't want that someone trades massively into two tokens and this changes the prices of all of the other tokens in the pool, right? So there are some additional features which are, um, which are coming from the fact that you now have all assets together, right? So every change in the system will affect everything, which is more complicated than it was before. And therefore, uh, there are some more sophisticated invariant measures. But we will talk about this um, in the next uh, next few sessions. Um, next question is coming from traditional finance, where capital and liquidity are two different things. Do you consider capital and liquidity separately? I se sense you see the same uh, same capital efficiency. How well is liquidity used in the system? Is probably a liquidity issue. Is there a separate risk-based capital element of Hydra DX AMM? Uh, Kubo, do you want to refer to this question? I mean, in my opinion, I'm talking only about like capital is coming in, capital is liquidity. Uh, so from, from, from the mechanism design uh, thing, but uh, from the business perspective, Kubo, you might have other. Um... Well, sorry, uh, I'm going through the border, so maybe I, I will be shut off, but uh, no, 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 we, we don't see capital uh, or capital efficiency same as liquidity, but the problem why, the, the reason why we are mentioning it so so often is that uh, like it's, it's natural is natural for the bonding cores and for the AMMs except of Uniswap V3 and that's the reason why uh, Uniswap team came with this like new version is that uh, liquidity uh, is spread over the core uh, like of course like it's, it's a little little bit concentrated in the, like in the mean mean price but but still it's uh it could be like much more concentrated and it it uh it depends on the it depends on the shape of the curve uh but uh it's also like as uh as crazy mentioned it, it, at the beginning uh is like with the capital inefficiency in in current AMS which are like breaking pools uh which are breaking like uh, liquidity for one asset to the like different pools 
is an issue which which we which we saw that we can uh, which we saw that we can solve. Cool. Thank you. Cool. And I would just uh, add that I think we are using the terms a little differently from a from traditional finance. Um, this is an all non custodial assets, right? We're not taking custody of these assets. Um, so it's about sort of the um, the return on investment is sort of what we mean by capital efficiency. Um, it, we're not, you know, capital, I think traditionally is the, um, basically the assets that a bank would have to absorb losses versus liquidity being uh, the assets they can uh, pay out kind of expected, um, expected near-term costs, but we don't have a centralized entity we're talking about here that is, taking custody of these funds. So we are using the terminology a little bit differently. Well, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, if uh, those all, all of those questions are now clear, um, ah, there is one additional question. Uh, Rudolf is giving some questions here. Could one assume that liquidity is just those parameter of the system that stays invariant when providing a set of assets that is providing liquidity? Uh, not, okay. This is, um, yeah, as Colin and, and Kuba described, so this is what we define and liquidity, but but uh, you you will see hopefully um, when the course uh, pr progresses, um, how um, how these terms are used and, and what we mean by them. Um, but in the end, it is uh, there is a distinction between um, making the, the pool work, making it function and making it Business, like uh, having the business ramifications of it. So, um, in some sense, uh, what I'm referring to always is how much quantity of token do you have because you want you want uh, the proper mechanisms, you want the proper um, uh, action sequences being represented accordingly, and we will then talk about uh, business implications later on. Let us talk about the metrics. Uh, we've mentioned some of them already, but uh, very briefly uh, to, to get them defined. So what do we have? Capital efficiency is, um, is uh, defined as the amount of assets required for one unit of impact on economic performance as measured by the performance metrics. So uh, this is a definition that tells you uh, how efficiently you use your capital that is in the or your liquidity in a liquidity pool um, on different metrics that are observable by agents. So you can say that you need, for example, this amount of liquidity for the slippage to move this amount, right? Or for the impairment loss to be that big. So this is the, this is the capital efficiency. And you will see, or basically this is the, the hypothesis here, that if you pull the assets together, you are more efficient because you need a less amount of capital or less amount of liquidity in the pool, and you will get the same impact on the metrics. So you will have the same sensitivity of the system and you will have the same behavior of the system that you would have if you split the liquidity into different liquidity pools. And ROI is the return on investment for the liquidity provider. So you can take it as, a, as, a, as an ob observed metric over a time. You can say, what is the return over one year if you provide liquidity to a liquidity pool? Impermanent loss is um, a measure that helps you to, to um, compare the investment of capital into the liquidity pool and to into a privately held portfolio. There are some impacts if you provide liquidity to the pool. This is because uh, due to the invariant properties of the pool, the liquidity has to change or like the, the, the amounts of liquidity have to change accordingly. So they have to respect these invariant properties and therefore you will have different behavior. You will have different prices and different movement of, of the quantities than uh, you would have if you would just simply hold your assets in, in your portfolio without providing them to the pool. Because if you hold them privately, they are not exposed to all of these trading activities and the changes and, and all of this behavior. So this is why you are always worse off um, in the pool compared to a private portfolio. But remember, you can earn liquidity uh, trading fees. You can earn trading fees if you're in the pool. So therefore you hope that you will, that the, the, these fees will mitigate the impermanent loss. And this is the biggest, uh, the biggest goal in the design of, of the liquidity pool. Slippage is, as we said, the movement of prices during swap. Liquidity volume is the amount of liquidity that is available in the system. The trading volume is the, the trading volume that is um, that is being traded over like a period, a day, a month, or, or whatever. And then there are some external metrics, so you can you can uh, you, you can have something outward facing um, because not only you have to define the pool and it's consistent for yourself and it has these properties and these metrics within, but it has some it also competes on the market with other uh, mechanisms and other uh, protocols. 
Therefore, you have the token price on other exchanges, definitely. So no one will trade at your uh, system if you have always a higher price. So no, no one will say, okay, I'm, go I'm coming to your system because it is just like for a trader, it's, it's a worse deal. Um, but also the slippage and the return on investment on the other exchanges or not only exchanges, but on other investment opportunities is not something that, uh, that attracts capital, right? So if you have liquidity and you see that I can earn so much here and I can earn so much here, as a liquidity provider, you will choose probably um, the exchange or the, or the system there you can you can get the most re rewards. Obviously, like considering all the risks and considering all the all the um, um, all the uh, other effects, but you will try to to um, to um, put your capital to to work at best. So these are the things that you are designing for. And now let me uh, show you something that comp that puts all of these things um, in um, in common or in in. Um, in together. And uh, you see here the green things here, the green dots are um, the things related uh, to trading. So you have the tra traders metrics. This is a trading volume and you have the slippage here. So these are the green dots. The blue ones are things related to liquidity provision. So you would have impermanent loss, you would have the return on investment and you would have liquidity volume in the pool. The yellow dots are parameters that you have. So you can choose your T in your system. You can choose a parameter A, we will get to it, but the parameter A is something that is related to the mechanism. So you can define a mechanism. The mechanism has a parameter and you can choose this parameter. It will, has, it will have some particular impact on, in that case, impermanent loss. And obviously we have this capital efficiency. So this is something that is not a parameter, but it is some, something more related to the structure of your liquidity pool. And we assume that if you have a more capital, um, capital efficiency, this will attract, you can, you can say that this would increase the liquidity volume because you would need less, less liquidity to have, the same, uh, to have the same effect, right? So there is this positive relationship between capital efficiency and liquidity volume. And the red dots are, external market. So you would have the return on investment you know, on the external market and you would have the slippage on the external market. And what this uh, causal loop diagram is trying to represent is trying to represent something, uh, how these uh, all of these things are connected. And um, this is just a GIF. So this is just like, a, it repeats itself again and again, uh, but I have um, this model built so I can show it to you and we can talk it a little bit through. But what I'm trying to represent here is that there is something that um, that is very good. So so if you have if you have high slippage, right? So if you have very high slippage in the system, you will have very sm little small trading volume. This means you have a small return on investment. This means that you have a small liquidity in your pool because no one wants to provide liquidity to, to your pool if the, if the return is small, right? So small, like small return, small volume, therefore high slippage because if you have small um, liquidity volume, this impacts the slippage very badly because you don't have much liquidity and each change in the system um, moves the prices stronger than if you had more liquidity. So therefore, uh, you have disconnection, but if you have high slippage, you will have um, little trading volume. So these are the main things that are uh, somehow connected. And what you can do and what this model is trying to represent, uh, but it goes a little bit crazy all the time because it's set to a particular uh, loop, uh, is that you can change the parameters. So you can try to change, for example, here now that you have a uh, high slippage, you can make the fee smaller. And you see that if you make the fee smaller, if you change this parameter as well, over time, if you have a smaller fee, this would attract the trading volume. The trading volume would, would attract um, the re return on investment uh, because it would increase the return. If you have more trading going on, then you would have more return for the, for the liquidity providers, which again means that you would have more volume in the system because more people would like to provide liquidity. And there, this means that you have less slippage. So you have already here these connections between all of, this, um, all of these variables and your possible points of impact. So you see that you can, for example, change the fee. You can make a dynamic fee. You can, you can make it um, react to the market conditions, or you can make it, uh, you know, like if you want to increase particular things and um, volume, you can, you can set the, the fee uh, very low such that these things happen as a consequence. You also have um, this, um, uh, this parameter A that is, um, uh, I will, you know, we will talk about it later in later, later sessions, but, but this parameter A is something that is related to the mechanisms and you can change this parameter such that you will have less impermanent loss. And if you have less impermanent loss, then this means that you have a higher um, impact of the return again. So there are governance features that you can, you can, you can uh, make use of uh, to optimize your system. And, and this is what is actually pretty cool. So let me move over here to this model, which we actually have here. 
and you see that it is say it is like in a static state now and you can say okay if i if i click play you see that nothing is happening right because we haven't really like you know push it in a particular direction but let us see what happens to the system if it's in balance if it's in, in equilibrium and we just you know decrease the fee what should happen if it decreases the fee we see that the trading volume should rise and uh, the return should go up because you have these relationships here defined. So this is obvious. And then you have this loop again that says higher return, higher liquidity, less slippage, le uh, higher trading volume, and again, higher return, right? So let's do this. Let's see what happens if we have a smaller fee. And you see automatically the trading volume goes up, return goes up, liquidity volume, slippage goes down. So these are the things that you can do, but obviously like the system is not that simple, right? But this is the key idea that you have to understand if you want to optimize your system for a particular goal. So you have to say, you have different stakeholders, you have different agents, you have these liquidity providers, they're looking for high returns. You have these traders, they're looking for low fees, but still the most important thing to optimize for would be the, the, the liquidity volume, because if you have high liquidity, then you have automatically low slippage and traders, you know, like they can pay a little bit of a fee, but they will have uh, this, this, this very good uh, metric that they're looking for with the very attractive trading conditions. So, so this is what can happen. If you can, for example, if you say now let the slippage on the external markets uh, decreases um, very much, right? So like uh, on the competition, right? So this means automatically that your trading volume decreases on your market. This means that automatically your return on investment is smaller. This means that your li uh, liquidity volume automatically is smaller and you have high slippage, right? So you have to react to these external conditions and therefore maybe you want to react by reducing the fee again, right? So you try to, co to counteract this, this, um, uh, this, um, this development. Maybe you want to set this parameter in some sense, uh, change it such that you get to, um, to a situation where you would be able to, you know, um, to, uh, to counteract this, this, this high slippage thing. This model obviously doesn't react accordingly, right? So it is not perfect. So I, it, 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 it doesn't happen what I wanted to, uh, to show. It doesn't happen that if I reduce the fee like to negative, that you would get rid of all of the slippage and oh, it actually maybe does, right? So, you, it, but it, yeah, it, it doesn't come true. But so, so this, is, this is the problem with this kind of casual loop uh, diagram, but therefore a cat cat model was built with exactly these ideas in mind to be able to find your optimal parameter selection process and your optimal me mechanism design um, for, your, for your system such that you are able to react to these mechanisms. Is there a comment from someone or a question? Uh, yeah, I can ask a question. Uh, sure. At this, at this particular stage, you know, before we go to the CAD CAD model, what is the justification for this particular model apart from, you know, you know, rationalize you know, I mean, on what basis do you say that this is this is correct? I mean, apart from the from an assumed logic. Yeah, uh, it is. It is a very naive assumption to say uh, you have different, like you have rational agents in a sense. They have some particular ideas in mind, and it is very easy or it's very safe to assume that the liquidity provider does it like provides liquidity to earn returns, right? So you can say this is a very logical assumption you can make. For a trader, and um, it is also a very easy assumption to, to make to say he wants to optimize for the trading fees and for the slippage. So this is also kind of intuitive, right? You can say this is a good intuition, right? And for the capital efficiency, this is just an ex experiment to say, okay, is it, is it really better, right? So if we pull the assets together and if we build a uh, the pool and if we, if we try to find a mechanism that solves all of the issues that we want it to solve, um, how do we perform compared to other and to other systems, right? So it is kind of an experiment, it is exploratory, but the agent behavior assumptions are, I would say pretty like based on intuition, but on very good intuition to say, not to say the least. But uh, I, 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 we presume that in the cat cat, uh, you know, model will be tested. These notions will be tested. <laughs> These assumptions can be tested. Yes. Yes, they, they can. Yes, they can. Yeah. So this this diagram was um, made actually ex post after we've already designed everything just for the purpose of the course, right? Just to for you to have a good visualization to see the intuition why we believe that there is a connection between agents incentives, uh, system parameters and external market conditions. And this is definitely not like the set in stone what you see here. 
but it is a good intuition to see that there are different metrics are different agents in the game they have different objectives and to perform the parameter selection and the mechanism design process is precisely to understand the trade-offs and to measure the trade-offs in a computational model and then put it to test on the market so the market will tell you if this is really true but you can build a good computational environment, perform experiments, and really see what the impact on particular things will be if you test these metrics, if you test these mechanisms, if you test these parameters. Okay. And actually one last question, um, just uh, asking how external slippage affects the system. Uh, it is also a very simple and naive assumption to say that uh, uh, this slippage uh, is something that uh, traders are looking for. So if you want to trade, right, if you want to exchange token A for token B, uh, you would uh, go to the market, to the exchange where you would have the best prices, but assumably all the prices are equal because we have this arbitrage uh, thing going on in between all of the exchanges. And then you would say, okay, now that we have the same price, let me now compare what will be the slippage on this market and what will be the slippage on this market uh, because here for the same amount that I'm trading in, I will receive a different amount uh, of the other currency. And therefore, if there is less slippage on the other market and you have the same um, uh, for, uh, quantity of token you want to exchange, you would probably like if you are well informed and if you are like, um, you know, um, versatile enough, you would always go to the market where uh, you have the best condition. So it is also a, a simple assumption to say like, okay, if there is a different market with better conditions, people will go there. And the same is for liquidity, right? So if there is a very obvious good investment or opportunity or liquidity opportunity, it might, it might not be an AMM even, it might be something different, completely different. Um, but if there is something like this on an external market, um, then people would uh, extract the liquidity from the liquidity pool and put it there. Right, so so these are kind of the things trying to be um, represented in this diagram. But again, this is only. Uh, yeah, can I ask one last, last question? I mean, sure. if you have to, uh, to optimize this, is there a single? I mean, in you know traditional finance, you know we can actually boil the whole thing down to say probably ROI. But in this particular, I mean, if I mean if you're trying to optimize this, uh, what would be the basis of I mean optimization? depending on your market needs and your business requirements. So it really depends what the system goals are and what the Hydro protocol aims to provide, right? So you have, when you design such a system, you will, you will say, okay, these are the main goals that we are trying to pursue and we can quantify these goals by particular metrics. And then we can say if this, the goals are being reached or not. And then we can make a, uh, we can choose our policies accordingly. Right. So, so this is how all of our design um, processes go. We first ask, okay, what are the goals? What is the purpose of the system? What do you want to optimize for? And then you can start optimizing, right? So you need, you can only optimize if you have a particular goal in mind. This goal has to be defined, agreed upon and decided. And then you can say now, let's say measure this goal, the, the, uh, how much this goal is being uh, actually reached and with metrics, with quantifiable metrics, and then try to find policies that would support the, the, you to, to reach the goal. So, so this would be the governance process in a nutshell. And a distinction I would make between um, the traditional finance and what we're doing here is that uh, the liquidity providers can have a wide variety of preferred risk profiles. Um, so instead of sort of you know, choosing risks we're comfortable with and then maximizing ROI, um, the sort of the optimization problem is a little different, right? Because you're wanting to provide a sort of set of risk profiles that liquidity providers are going to like, but they might have different preferences. Um, so I think in terms of, I think sort of the design optimization looks a little bit different. Yeah, correct. Cool. Yeah, also, uh, I just want to add that in crypto, it could be like tricky because of the, uh, the many people they are like they have like different means of like ROI. So someone someone has a goal to accumulate as much Bitcoin. Someone has like uh, someone is tracking its ROI in uh, in dollar terms. So it could be like really someone in ETH. So it's like very different, I would say. And also, and everyone has like a little bit different like time preference. And there's also that could be like something about like practicality when you can present some LP shares. Uh, you can use, for example, as a collateral in like uh, on money market. 
Cool. Uh, I see another question by Rudolf in the chat uh, about stability. This is a good question, but uh, let let me move this question uh, for the next that is postpone it for the next ten minutes because we have a section on goals and requirements uh, upcoming. Uh, I first want to make sure that uh, that this uh, this part of the session is complete because. This was kind of the, the motive, right? So it was kind of the motive to say, now we have different design choices and now this is what you came up to um, to optimize, right? So you have to find these, uh, these um, uh, align the incentives of different system participants. So understand your stakeholders, understand their needs, understand their, um, their requirements and say, now you want to provide a system that A, uh, does what it is intended to do. So facilitates even token exchange and liquidity provision and return on investment. But also you have to make everyone who's uh, the participant in the system happy. So you want to give them proper long-term incentives to, um, to fulfill their, their goals and their needs. And, um, and this is basically what, what uh, is the, what the, the, the whole engineering process is all about. And next, we will move over to a more bird's eye perspective of the Hydro system where we say, this is just a liquidity subsystem, right? So remember, we are, we are talking about the token economy here, and this token economy consists of several subsystems. One of them is the liquidity thing, right? So you have these traders, you have the arbitrageurs, you have the liquidity providers, and they interact with the mechanisms. Perfect, right? But there are other things going on as well. And um, the process that we are going to teach you or that we're going to discuss with you in the next few, few sessions um, is something that you can uh, reuse for the design of any system, of any subsystem. So this um, the definition of stakeholders, definition of agents, specification, definition of metrics, everything that you have um, uh, as a toolkit helps you to understand every particular isolated subsystem that you are trying to define, and then you can optimize for it to perform well. And then the biggest challenge is to compose those systems because it is the case that in, that in complex dynamical systems that we have here, tokenized systems are complex dynamical systems, you, you cannot just disentangle the subsystems, say, okay, now you set this, you set this, you set this, you set this, and now you put them together and hope it will run as intended because it won't, because these subsystems also interact with each other and interfere with each other. So um, then the second step would be of the process to once you've, either you've optimized or you have defined, you've understood your subsystems, then you have to like try to, to build the model and try to understand how the combination of the subsystems will now perform. But this is the next, next step uh, in your endeavor. But still you can, the design process of each system is the same, right? So this is what we will discuss with you. But uh, let me uh, go to the next slide. And here you will be able to see that uh, we have uh, talked about this. And now we talk about the different subsystems and value flows in the hydro economy. So we've talked, uh, we really isolated our discussion on this liquidity subsystem. So this is what it is all about, right? So this is, would be the exchange mechanism, liquidity pools and so on. But you also have the governance subsystem, the security subsystem and the power chain subsystem. Here you see that the tokens um, are being in flow, so be being used by, by agents uh, held privately. And these are the tokens that are being um, attributed to the system treasury. So in total, you have these uh, four subsystems and you have like the user token and the protocol governed token on the right hand side. And now you see that there are different value flows. And you see that, for example, you can, uh, you can stake, that this would be, for example, the user stake from float to liquidity would mean that there is someone as a liquidity provider who has these tokens in float, privately held, he can provide it to the liquidity subsystem. And in return, you would have something that is, um, that is uh, described here as IL, which is the interest rate on liquidity. It isn't really an interest rate because you don't earn an interest rate. You actually earn trading fees, but it's like a naming convention. We can say this is the internet uh, in, in the interest rate for liquidity. So this would mean if you provide uh, some stake to the liquidity pool, you can earn rewards. And this is also the case if you provide some liquidity to the security of the protocol. So if you, for example, if you have a proof of stake system as you have here in, in, in the Hydra case, which is a system that works on the, in the Polkadot um, ecosystem, uh, this means that you can stake tokens for security. So you also can use your liquidity instead of providing it to the liquidity pool. You can say, I'm preferring to use my liquidity that I have to stake for the validators and because I want them to secure the protocol accordingly. And then you would have to earn rewards from staking. And these rewards from staking can be described as an interest rate that you get from staking. 
Um, which also again means that you have this alternative uh, investment opportunities. As someone who is here um, with liquidity, you can decide where do you want to put your liquidity to and what is the expected return that you will have. So uh, you see that these systems are connected, right? So if you have too much return on, on, on liquidity, uh, this means that all of the capital will flow in here, but no one would like to attribute a capital here, here, or here, which means that the system breaks because it is unsecure and no one is securing the protocol and so on, right? So there are these balances that you have to keep in mind when you design something like this and that, uh, that are non-trivial. Uh, another system that is the parachain system, which basically means that you can, uh, from float, you can also invest into the parachain slot, because since we have a Polkadot environment, um, users are also invited to stake for the parachain auction, where they say, okay, now we want to secure the slot, and we want to, uh, we want to be, continue our chain in the Polkadot environment. Which again, which again means that there has to be some reward because why should someone stake, um, stake their liquidity to the power change slot if, um, if there is no return being promised, right? So because there are other ways to solve this. But this is obviously some only like high level logical explanation. There are other ways to solve this. So it is not maybe necess necessarily required for the users to provide the, um, provide the, the, the stakes for the power change slot. It can also be the case that there is something that the protocol does, right? So the protocol is trying to secure the slot. But this is something, again, which is a policy and then a choice and a governance choice uh, which is coming from the protocol side. And the uh, governance subsystem, again, uh, is taking care of all of the decisions of the protocol, right? So voting mechanisms and everything that is related to this. In all of your token economies, you have different conditions how to participate in governance of your economy. And there is also some capital allocation for the, for the votes to be representative or um, to make sense or not to be um, spammed and so on. So, so there are these different things, at least these four that you can define and say, these things have to interplay with each other for your system to make sense, right? So not only your liquidity, your liquidity pool, the liquidity pool structure, the mechanisms, the parameters of the exchange work, but the system in its entirety um, has, it has a proper coordination between all of these things. Um, yeah. Just, just to do a quick pace check, uh, we have about a half hour left, so. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'm 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 getting to to an end in the next ten and fifteen minutes. So we have we will have enough time um, in the end for discussions. Uh, but uh, but this is just for you to see that there are different subsystems going on, and and uh, the process, the methodology that we will explain and design. Uh, we will take as an example the liquidity subsystem because this is what we did first, right? You have to make uh, you have to make sure that the liquidity system makes sense for the whole protocol to make sense. But uh, you can reuse this methodology to design all other components and then see how they how well they fit together. System roles, we um, already did, discussed a little bit um, in, in the sense that we said in the beginning, there are some different roles and that take place in different on different directions and different places in the protocol. Uh, you have these governance roles. So they are the roles that are mainly concerned with the control over specific parts of the ecosystem. Their activities make sure that technical system functionalities are ensured, and that the political and economic balances are maintained. So governance is always connected to, um, to control of the technical thing, right? So you have to system upkeep, system, system maintenance in a sense, and making sure that you have uh, the, the proper um, functionalities, that the, the system works, that the, everything is, is, uh, is technically secure, uh, that you have no difficulties in execution of the system. But this is only one part. So the system to be reliable in the technical sense, it also has to be reliable in a political and economic sense. So you have to have these balances in the political power. You have to make sure that um, the, uh, that everyone uh, who has uh, voting rights um, and that, that, that this is already also uh, well distributed. Because if you attribute only voting rights to your liquidity providers, and then they would vote for the fees to go up uh, until infinity because they would see short-handed, uh, short-sighted. They would see, okay, this this might lead me to a bigger gain because higher fees is are good for me because I'm providing liquidity and traders have to pay more. But um, this would consequently result in a situation where no one would like to trade anymore with this pool, and therefore you would make no return, right? So you have to make sure that also 
traders have some uh, right to say what the proper parameters should be, or other people who are interested in the long-term uh, prosperity and good evolution of the ecosystem. So this is key, right? So you have to, uh, same as in a democracy, you have to make sure that all people who are involved have um, have a good uh, say in the evolution of the protocol, in the in the in the governance of the protocol, uh, such that all the interests and all of the um, all of the desires of the participants are um, uh, met accordingly. Uh, then you have internal roles. So th these would be people who are um, not very much looking on the outside, right? So people who are just, you know, um, uh, focusing on uh, interacting with the main functionality of the protocol. In this case, it is simply an exchange mechanism and then liquidity provision uh, mechanism. So the internal roles would be the liquidity providers and the traders. And then you have the interface roles, the uh, roles who are uh, actions evolved around the Hydra ecosystem. So they would look at, compare the Hydra market to other markets um, and, and try to act accordingly and so on. And most importantly, the, the, these are the arbitrageurs because these are the people who, who basically have an overview of what's going on in different, different systems and, and work as an interface between, between different economies. Um, so let us go back to the Hydra goals and requirements because now I said before that we will talk about this section a bit. So what are the main goals? The main goal is to, to build an interchain token exchange where the needs of liquidity providers and traders are aligned. So you have to, to understand both incentives and to understand, to, to connect them accordingly. And um, for the liquidity providers, you have the opportunity to invest capital with a high and reliable return. This is this goal. And for the traders, the goal is to have a fast, easy and cheap asset trading with low slippage. So to do so, uh, you have to explore different design options and system parameterizations to optimize the system performance. In particular, increase the capital efficiency. We talked about this by pooling all assets together into the Omni pool. So this is the biggest uh, new idea of the Hydra team. They say, now let's pull all, all of the assets together. We will have um, higher capital efficiency. Therefore, we assume that this will have a positive impact on the trading trader and liquidity metrics. The long-term goals for the system, however, are this uh, reliability and sustainability. So it doesn't really make sense to, you know, get rich quick or, or, or set up a system that will work only on the, on the short side. And you want to have something that is sustainable, that is working reliably, and you have like a proper ec economic and, and political governance mechanisms that help the system to, to adapt to changing market conditions and, and technical conditions. And obviously, the long-term goal is a price stability and to for, for, uh, for the for the Hydra token to have a predictability of service costs and long-term security of power chain slot. So there has to be something that uh, helps you to understand that you are connected to other as, um, economies as well. And if you have a good exchange rate or like a, at least a stable exchange rate to other systems, you can predict um, whether the system will operate in the long term or not because you know and um, how much service cost you have and how much you need from the capital to be able to, to connect to, to, to all of the other economies. And ultimately, will, yeah. yeah, sorry, so, uh, let me finish. I, I, I just, yes, sorry, sorry. Yeah, and, and ultimately the value creation into the native token HDX and uh, creation of multi-purpose assets for DeFi. So I think that Jakobo wants to talk uh, also a, a little bit about this saying that once you've got set up this liquidity pool, once you've attracted liquidity and once you've facilitated this token exchange mechanism, now you can build something on top of it. Right? So you have a native token, it has some value because it fulfills a very important role in the ecosystem. But also since you have this liquidity in the pools, now you can build financial products maybe, like the decentralized financial products. So these would be the long-term goals and, and the requirements, but uh, uh, Kuba, please uh, feel free to add something. Yeah, uh, I just want to briefly add that for, for us, the one of the main goals was also like a uh, safe system for ecosystems because we were you know, in the Ethereum for, for for some for some time and like we, we can see the all the hacks and uh, and the reason why we why we start to work with block science and why we choose this like much harder and and timely timely way like doing all these like mechanism designs and, and graphs and, and cat cut implementations is not because it's like fancy or or we want to or we want to uh, put too much of academia uh, <laughs> through our work, but actually because the, all these like nuances in, in DeFi systems and all the composability, which 
which blockchains uh, are allowing are basically opening uh, much more of like attack surface on the on the users on the users capital. So it's not just anymore like technical technical bugs or, or technical issues, but also like economical uh, exploits. Like for example, like when when we saw the first flash loans on Ethereum, that was something which was unexpected, but it happens also it happens uh, quite a few times af after the first flash loan attacks because the, the developers just didn't account like with these possibilities. That's, that's the one thing. And the second thing, uh, why we are building Hydra, how, how we are building it is like the challenge really like centralized exchanges and centralized counterparties because uh, when you realize that the Bitcoin after like 12 years after its creation, like is, is very highly relying on like centralized institutions. Uh, it's, uh, it's not good. And uh, for the curve, the AMM for the swapping uh, stable coins or like highly correlated assets like wrapped, uh, wrapped forms of Bitcoin, it, it proved that even like AMMs or smart or uh, or DApps decentralized applications can really can really challenge the centralized uh, centralized institutions or even provide much better service than, than the centralized counterparties. But that's funny because the history of AMM is the, or like the motive behind the AMM was that AMM were created as a, like out of necessity when people and developers realize that the blockchains are not very good in, in like doing decentralized order book system uh, but now we realize that when now we finally have like scalable blockchains uh, and a lot of like zero knowledge uh, proofs magic which can like help a lot with scalability so now we can finally challenge uh, centralized institutions and make the whole space better cool Thank you, Kuba. Now I can address the questions that are in the chat. And as I promised, uh, there is a question by Rudolf. Uh, he said that one criteria could be for a goal or requirement could be simply given by stability. The system has to reach an equilibrium given enough time. Otherwise, it may be highly instable until breaking down as a whole, which is true. So this is uh, putting in the context what, uh, what uh, I've described on the previous slide is definitely the case. But I wouldn't go that far to say that we want to reach an equilibrium because this is not how dynamical systems are intended to work. You, if you reach an equilibrium, you might even get into a situation where you can't escape. Uh, but uh, uh, I would put it in, an, in the context of, uh, of the market conditions. So the system has to be able to react accordingly, swiftly to the changing market conditions such that it will perform its functionality as intended. So you have to be able to perform particular system governance, uh, choose parameters, set uh, different criteria, maybe adapt some mechanisms and so on, um, so that you upkeep the main functionality. So you will say, you will have a good exchange mechanism. You will have a good liquidity provision mechanism and some, something on the market change, you have to react to it, you can do this, right? So this would be one of the, of the system goals, but definitely, Stability in the sense that it's predictable, it is reliable, and it, it has some um, explanation. Um, we have another question about what is the parachain? Can you give an example of a protocol reward? Um, and the parachain, yes. yeah. Or I, I can uh, the parachain is blockchain, which uh, instead of like bootstrapping its own uh, security model with own set of validators or or miners, it has it has rented security from like external chain, like for example, this case, like Polkadot is providing security to all parachains, which are connected via its like uh, security model. So, so Polkadot validators is actually providing this service of like secure, uh, secure finality and consensus uh, for these parachains. So then they don't need to like invest a lot of resources and time to like bootstrapping on validator or, or miners uh, set. And what could the protocol reward then be? Oh, yeah. So, so there is like a few different kinds of protocol rewards. There is a liquidity mining reward for people, for the people who will be helping bootstrap overall liquidity uh, in the Hydra DX system. Uh, this will be kind of a little bit different than in other systems because this will be like long-term initiative. 
uh, it will be it will be increased over the time uh, rather than like putting as as high reward uh, at the beginning and then like decreased. Uh, then then there will be like some staking rewards for like securing some like uh, special purpose uh, functionalities of. Uh, of ecosystem life, for example, there will be like Oracle service, but these like uh, Oracles, these like service providers uh, who are providing uh, uh, price feeds from external sources, they have, they need to have like skin in the game. So they, they need to like put stake. Uh, so it will be like secure. And there are like few other type of functions which need to be like secured by stake. And stake is obviously in the, in the HDX. Cool. Uh, thank you. The next question, maybe someone from your team also can refer to, does HDX support zero knowledge proofs architecturally for all participants in the value chain? Like it's, it's like much broader question, uh, which, which I think can be like a little bit broken down to more like specifically, but uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Hydra is a, is a as a technique or as a protocol will support these like zero knowledge proofs uh, systems but we uh it's like it's it's quite early right now because the the there is there is not many sectors or industries which has currently such cambrian explosion as like zero knowledge proofs so we are also like observing like which one would fit best for our use cases uh and users so that's that's a little bit early. Uh, the Hydra is currently like scaling enough, so this is like on the like in the midterm roadmap to provide even like higher scalability or like more efficient scalability. Cool, thank you. And the next question is um, thinking about curve. They increase fees for longer. You lock up liquidity up to four years. How does Hydra DX prevent a modern run where people pull out their liquidity pools at very short notice? And um, so this is something related to the governance, economic governance uh, of a system. Uh, uh, one way to answer it would be by precisely what we're trying to design in this course, dynamic fees. So you have different parameters that you can choose for your governance policy. And one of them would be, for example, a fee structure, but there are many other things that you can implement as parameters as well. And obviously having the system in compared to the competition on the market and seeing how it performs given particular conditions and what's going on, now you need to understand how changes in your parameters and changes in your economic governance, uh, which impact will they have on the behavior of, of the of agents in the economy. And uh, one goal of the Hydra um, the collaboration with block science is not only to build a model of their ecosystem, but also to make something that is a cat cat model that would be allowed to compare across different AMNs and different pools so that you can explore different um, scenarios when you see that there, you have different uh, changing market condition. But in a nutshell, the answer is uh, you can choose your parameters accordingly. One of the parameters that you can design is the fee. And this is what we are here to do. But there may, might be other parameters to choose as well to counteract these measures. Yeah, but overall, that, that was a great question. And that's, uh, that will be maybe like second part of this course or, or someone can join us uh, to help with this. Because really, like right now, the liquidity provisioning, uh, liquidity providing on on Ethereum, DeFi is really like very mercenary, and you can see like from the early days of new protocols, like there is like hundreds or even hundreds millions of dollars, and then they are like pull out and and move elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 quite a lot about like incentive structure and the co and the type of community which you want to build. So it's like, do you want to build something for like few months or do you want to build something for like years or even like decades? Cool, thank you. And then we have a comment by Rudolf who says that, uh, the, uh, that uh, there was a misunderstanding with the equilibrium definition uh, that uh, he, he claims that it is a description of the system based on differential equations should never come up with divergent values but find always a state that is stable with respect to specific invariances, which is precisely uh, what, uh, what uh, is the case here. So thank you for this clarification. Uh, this hits the nail. 
Cool. Uh, so let us wrap up. We have 10 more minutes and I will give you an outlook uh, for the next sessions of the course and, and um, reinforce the idea what, why we came here for. And then we will have some, some time for, for final conversation and discussion questions and so on. So what's going on? Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have the com conversation that the pool mechanisms interplay with the pool structure. We know this. So we know that um, the, an AMM is a system that obeys to prescribed invariances derived from business requirements, which dictate how the mechanisms work. Which means that your AMM will do whatever you tell it to do based on the requirements that you impose on the system. So you start with business requirements, then you say this is what you want to happen, then you can define some invariances, and then out of these invariances, you are able to derive some mechanisms. But in the AMM context, there are three typical mechanisms involved, which is the add remove liquidity mechanism and the swap token mechanism. Now, the Hydra team wants to use the same set of mechanisms, so those three, with specific functionalities in accordance with their needs and the needs we've discussed, right? Pull all, pull, pull all of the assets together, improve uh, performance metrics for the system participants and build particular, be able to build a reliable system for the long term and then a potential assets, asset for the DeFi and ecosystem. Um, in a nutshell, we have a Uniswap system that has two assets where they are tied together via one invariance equation, for example, the constant product and a constant function market maker to construct a pool. And there are multiple pools of two assets each. In the Hydra case, we have N assets that are tied together and there's only one pool for multiple assets. So this is what, what, the, what the goal and what the, what the design idea is, right? Build an AMM, has, have the same mechanisms, but with these, uh, this main change in mind. And um, uh, you see that, that the generic mechanisms as described are provide liquidity on the left-hand side. Uh, you provide liquidity in token A2. The protocol mints the base token on the right-hand side and you receive a share of the asset that you provided. This is the one mechanism. And the other mechanism is you provide something in the token A2. So you swap token A2 in and you swap token A3 out. So these are the things that you want the system to allow with the business constraints that you've imposed. What, how do we go on, we're gonna talk about this? So the, the session today was only to set the stage, describe the system and explain why the upcoming methodology is important, right? So for you to be able to understand what an AMM is, what the nuances of the Hydra AMMs are, what the different stakeholders of the system are, what their incentives are and how to connect them. And also what different subsystems you have in the Hydra ecosystem with the focus on the liquidity, sure, but also there are other things that you want to keep in mind when designing such things. In the remainder of the course, we will explain the block science engineering process in a contextualized fashion. So in the Hydra context, while explaining the Hydra system, and we will explain the generalized dynamical system framework. Uh, so a mathematical framework that helps you to pin down a dynamical system with equations and uh, describe how uh, states of the system are changing over time and how to restrict these changes so, so that they fulfill your invariances that you want to have. And um, how, uh, how this, uh, this framework can be used to describe systems that control evolution in the context of, for example, Hydra. We will define the business requirements that led to a mechanism design problem for the Hydra AMM. We will write the mathematical formulation of the requirements, the system states and mechanisms. And we will introduce the CAT-CAT model and that is used for, for the design verification but also the impact analysis and performance optimization. So this is what the next sessions will be all about. And then you're free to choose whatever you want to research on for, from session seven on to say, okay, now I understand the process. Now I understand what, what's, what the system is, what's going on. Now let's do something with it. The goals for the next sessions are for at each stage for you, to, for everyone to agree that to, the, what is being analyzed, what is being derived, what is being assumed and what is being implemented into the computational environment. So this is why we emphasize the first six sessions so that everyone can follow along and see the steps that we're going through that we all are on the same page. For everyone to understand the system and subsystems, their boundaries and interfaces with each other, how design choices will impact the performance of the system and to gain sufficient theoretical and methodological understanding so that future sessions with coding and hacking can optimally be used for design iterations. So this is it. This is what I wanted to show you today. We've got five or seven minutes spare to talk about to talk. And um, I will explain um, a bit of the of the homework assignment because we have something prepared for you to uh, to do already. But if there are any questions, if there is a discussion going on, I'm I'm happy to to uh, engage with you for the remainder of the time.
Yes. Yeah, also feel feel free to ask uh, in token engineering channels afterwards, like for example, tomorrow or whenever you will have some like misunderstanding or, or if you will be like thinking about it. I was thinking about the, the concept of pools as a whole and it, it kind of struck me. Uh, it's it's a bit narrow-minded, I think, if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, because we could model the system uh, with a kind of uh, dynamic pool structure that is uh, uh, always find two collection of assets that uh, guarantee the most stable equations by simply not assuming a fixed pool structure, but uh, just a kind of mixing matrix uh, as, as we have it with the neutrinos in physics, uh, just <laughs> even more dynamically. Uh, is, is such approach uh, discussed somewhere? Is, is this already in development anywhere or, or has this never been brought up to invention? We have explored different pool structures and different mechanisms that are in inherited from the pool structure, uh, but uh, it is kind of an iterative process and it's good to start with something that you're on the safe side with. So when you say, okay, now you fix the structure, now you find mechanisms for requirements that are connected, uh, that are derived from the structure and you get something that is uh, being possible to be implemented in a model and then you can iterate uh, from it. Uh, but it's a definitely an interesting concept. So if you if you if you uh, understand that you have different possibilities how you could design the pool or how you could structure the pool, and you can make some hybrid uh, transitions between these structures, yes. this is something that that you could explore uh, over time. Uh, but uh, again, my recommendation here would be to start with all of the um, uh, st static structures separated first, and then see how the combination of this hybrid uh, model will impact the performance of the system. Because um, uh, it's easier to start with something easy, tangible, and you know, uh, easy to work with before making it more complicated. But definitely an, a nice, a nice idea and a good approach. Yeah. Yeah, and any any out of the box kind of thinking is like very much welcome. Like even we have like internally a lot of crazy or, or more exciting ideas, mm -hmm. and like that, that's the reason why we choose to build as a parachain mm -hmm. uh, or as a like application specific chain because. It really allows us to, to to change the design to whatever we we will have consensus or agreement uh, with all the stakeholders and community that this is really the this is really the like better approach or better design and, and we can like uh, there are like this concept of forkless upgrades we can like really just via runtime upgrades and via like on chain on chain governance voting we can like really upgrade pretty easily the chain so. So yeah. Well, thanks for the good answer and, and thanks a lot for the for the great presentation. Thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments from from the participants? Um, so this is Kate here. Just a, a quick comment. Um, so there are a couple of institutions out there who are building solutions in the institutional. Uh, space. So just wondering, is there a uh, iteration of HydroDX model that could be adapted uh, for the institutional space or the regulated space, perhaps? Yeah, uh, I, I don't, I don't see like like technical problem here. I'd like to say, I mean, how is it different? Like obviously, in the like. If if we will if we will agree on on it that we want person to somehow interact with fiat, but it's like obviously on the like fiat side there has to be like some like KYC AML onboarding process or something like that. And there are even like smart contract solutions, for instance. So yeah, but those can be built but, on top of this. Yeah, but even like institutions, they are like more and more used to. Uh, used to use DeFi and crypto like directly, like of, of course it's like, like it's like very, very minor, or like very very uh, small niche of institutions. But uh, but they if if they see if they see the opportunity uh, and if they are like comfortable with with tech, like they are even like used to it. Interesting. Uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for your insight. 
Actually, cool. even even institutions they see the proactive approach is like much more profitable. So you can see like institutions who are not like waiting for others to solve this, but they are often like uh, they are so, directly they are directly working with founders. They are uh, they are voting in on chain governance. They are buying tokens on secondary uh, secondary markets. Some some institutions they are even like building their own like mining facilities. Or or uh, or staking services. So so they realize that the, the space is moving too fast that they can uh, they they can wait. Definitely okay. it draws some synergies to the existing project that I'm working on. So keen to kind of hear that uh, hear more of your thoughts uh, when we have a discussion off chain, perhaps. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Uh, thank you for your comments and contributions. I would like to use like one more or two more minutes to uh, show you the homework assignment. So uh, what you're about to do for this week, uh, we want simply to to get you to uh, to run a model, uh, and we have prepared for you an example model of the of of the CatCat Hydra ecosystem. So you will get access to a GitHub repo that contains those files. And here you have a README document that explains to you how to, uh, how to install the model and where to access all of the information that you need. You can click on it, you can open it, you can see there are the, the academy details, the course description, and also reading materials, but also an, an, a guide how to install and how to get started with CatCat. So you can, you can make use of this. And then uh, once you've uh, installed it, you can click on an example notebook that is in this repo uh, and uh, you can run it. And if you do so, you will see um, how we um, how we implemented in the CatCat um, environment and, and, and a Hydra instance that is able to show what's going on uh, with respect to two variables, I think two assets in, a, in an Omnipool. So you would be able to see what uh, the variables that are defined here. You would see the data frame, and then you would see the, all the state variables for the Hydra instance and what's going on. So you would see what happens for an example action sequence that is said where the, where the default experiment is set up for to last for um, 400 uh, for 100 time steps and you would have someone to provide liquidity here and remove liquidity here at this at this point in time and some trades uh, being happening in between so this is actually what would happen in the asset uh, risk asset i so I, the it uh, I the risk asset, there is at time step 10, someone is providing liquidity and then you have random swaps between asset I and J in the pool. And then this person is removing liquidity. You see what's going on with the reserve, the shares, the price for the asset and the coefficient for the asset I. What's going on with the, with the uh, Jth asset? As you see, it's only being traded, right? So there is no liquidity events um, going on because you don't see this uh, add and remove thing. You just see random trades in between and uh, what's going on with the other variables of the Jth assets. Uh, you would see the relative prices uh, of both assets. You would see the value change uh, between the, those assets. Uh, and you would be able to go into other different um, uh, representations. You can, you can have a look. And then you would also see what's going on on the agent level. So you would have agent. We currently defined eight agents that would uh, even perf that would, uh, perform the actions that we defined. So there is someone who is providing liquidity, someone who is removing liquidity, someone who is trading. And here you see the, that they are, they are at the local state. So their token holdings at the beginning of the simulation, after 12 time steps of the simulation, and at the end of the simulation. Then you see, you can even go into the token holding. So you see that, for example, agent two is the one who is providing liquidity and removing liquidity. And agent five is the one who is doing the random swaps and other and all of the other agents do nothing. And then you also would see what the value changes are for the agents um, uh, in the ecosystem. So this is just an example model. It has one example sequence, it particularly that is um, this uh, add, remove, remove liquidity and, um, and the swaps in between sequence uh, implemented. But it's a good way for you to get started with uh, with the uh, with the CatCat model of an Hydra ecosystem, and you can even go into the model folder where you would be able to explore the files and see how it's being set up, how the simulation is being set up, and how um, uh, how CatCat is working. You can go into the um, subfolder parts. You would see what how Hydra is doing the state updates and so on. You don't really need to to understand everything that's going on there because we will talk you through during the course, so you will be able to make use of this model to make um, um to expand on this model and perform own experiments. But the goal, your assignment until next time, is to to get this repo 
get the, the, this uh, CatCat installed on your uh, local machine and get this notebook running. So to see uh, how to how how CatCat is working and how you can access the experiments and the model. So this would be it uh, from my side. Um, we will uh, share all the links and all the information to this repo in, in the channels. But uh, besides that, I think that's it. So this is what I wanted to talk with you today. If there are no more questions, I'm happy to close the session, but also I'm happy to give hand over to Peter or Angela for, or Jakub to some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Amazing, thank you, Chris. Yeah, claps. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Yeah, that's um, pretty much it from, I think our side as well. Um, I just actually, I will show, since we're one minute over, I'll go really quick, but um, I'm gonna share my screen again quick and give some exciting updates from the token engineering community, um, since we are all part of the token engineering community in these sessions. Um, so let's see, main update uh, to wrap up um, from the token engineering community is that the TEC has hatched um, so for anybody who has been around uh, the Discord channels um, for token engineering, you've probably seen the TEC, and um, that has been a giant project for the last few months trying to build an economy around token engineering to fund public goods. Super exciting. Um, it's been fundraising for the last uh, month and finally reached the minimum goal. So um, the hatch is still open through the end of the week even, and more funds are coming in. So it's super exciting. Uh, check it out if you haven't. Um, probably one of the, the biggest projects um, in token engineering uh, at the moment. Um, really cool community too. So uh, definitely visit that. Uh, another update from uh, the TE Academy is that we have a uh, another event series starting um, called the Governots, and it's focused on uh, token engineering um, applied to governance. So if this is something you're interested in, um, I'll put the link in the channel as well. Um, and yeah, lastly, we sent out our newsletter this week uh, for the TE Academy. So I will post this too in the channel um, if you'd like to check it out, see what other exciting things are going on. And you guys are all featured since you're, you're part of the, um, yeah, part of the research program. So um, yeah, that's, that's really all we had uh, for final updates. Um, I guess we can let everybody go and we'll see you all back here next week. Same time, same place. Um, and we'll be in touch on discord in the meantime. So that's great. Thanks again, Chris. Awesome presentation. Thank all you. Right. Bye everyone. Bye, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Cheers guys.